Hello everyone, welcome back for another 101 session here online. Um, <clears throat> we're, we're definitely coming up to the end of our schedule. And um, with losing Monday and things with uh, the Williams paper going a little long, um, I'm going to have to really think about how we use our remaining time. Um, I did want to kind of say something on the record here, though, as far as uh, the class the class design in general and how the schedule is going to kind of work out. Um, so philosophy has, if you remember way back from the beginning of the quarter, philosophy has three main divisions to it. There's metaphysics and epistemology, which we've spent a lot of time with this quarter. And then there's ethics. And ethics is actually my area of specialization. Um, and I think it's a really in, important part of, of philosophy. In the world of philosophy, there's a reason why it's one of the big three. It's kind of its own, it could even be called half of philosophy if we're thinking about the descriptive normative distinction. Um, oh, yes, Hudson, uh, the response paper is still due today. Yep, that's right. Yep. Yeah, okay. So um, ethics is important. And, um, and I wanted to have it represented in this class uh, in the original design of the course, uh, even if uh, it was going to be done in a no somewhat non-standard way, which was my original intention, and still is my intention. Um, and the reason why ethics hasn't had a more prominent place in this 101 curriculum is primarily because um, at Bellevue College, there aren't a lot of philosophy department offerings, course offerings. Um, so you don't have a dedicated class to metaphysics. You don't have a dedicated class to epistemology. Every once in a while, we've run a a class on theory of knowledge, but it's very rare and it doesn't fill usually, and so there's all that. Um, but we do have Philosophy 102. It's called Contemporary Moral Problems, and it is a class completely devoted to ethics, and especially the way I teach it, uh, I teach Contemporary Moral Problems not sort of as like a current affairs class as much as uh, an introduction to ethical theory. So if studying uh, moral philosophy and ethics is something that you're really, really interested in, I highly recommend taking 102. The reason, um, there's some really classic uh, works of ethics um, or kind of the main divisions of ethical theory that are really important um, and definitely the starting point. And a lot of times a 101 class will dabble in them. Um, and I have elected not to do that. And for a couple reasons. One, I didn't want there to be tons of overlap in the curriculum between 101 and 102 if a student wanted to take both of them. Um, you know, I didn't want it to be redundant, you know. Um, but also, I find the those kind of core, there's, there's three big ethical theories that are on offer. One of them is called virtue ethics. Another is called utilitarianism. You might have heard of utilitarianism before. And the other one is Kantian ethics, which is a reference to Immanuel Kant, who we talked about before. Kant's a big deal in ethics. I mean, kind of a big uh, stone in the pond. Uh, Kantian ethics is sort of the theoretical foundations for modern notions like human rights theories and, and stuff of that nature. The dignity of humans. Um, the uh, sort of like people are intrinsically valuable and um, we, we have treat each other. So matters of justice usually go into that category um, of Kantian ethics. Um, but those theories are <clears throat> You can find tons of like YouTube videos or like Crash Course or something that like gives you the broad overview um, in a in a short presentation, and I find that those presentations really don't do those theories justice, and in many cases are quite misleading in terms of what's actually going on with them. And I didn't want to do that. I, I've seen many 101 curriculums and and 101 textbooks and and seen how I've been in classes you know as a student teaching that material quickly. And I don't think it, it's really, it doesn't really serve a student to get that. You get, um, it, it's never bad to get some information rather than no information, but um, I think those theories really deserve a uh, much more serious study. The, the cartoon versions that get presented of them really don't do them justice. And you don't come away with a, a, a notion of like why what, why do they deserve so much respect or, or just how powerful and robust they are as moral theories. The other thing that usually gets left out in a quick presentation of them, most of the time all you can manage is just to describe the what's of the theory and not get into the why. And, ooh, sorry.
Sorry about that. Whew. That was a big sneeze just nailed me. Um, you don't. So I was saying, uh, you don't get into the whys of the theory. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Um, and uh, those are so important. Um, many of you have asked in passing here and there when we've touched on normative issues, like how do you defend the idea of objective, universal, moral truth? And that's a really big question and uh, and a difficult one to answer. I think I've mentioned before that this has been that that question has preoccupied me more than any other subject in my professional life as a moral philosopher and as an ethicist. Uh, it's it's one of my kind of topics of of um, specialization. Um, and there are answers. There. They're disputed, you know, they're controversial, like everything in philosophy, but there are some really um, good options here for having optimism about things like objective moral truth. And we, we've touched on this a little bit with the Williams reading, but only, only, only uh, the tip of the iceberg here in terms of um, identifying uh, what, what we could have any confidence to begin with in it or something like that. Like, like what you come away with from Nagel's arguments is like, what else are you going to do? You can't do anything else, so you have to play the game. But there's still major questions about how to play that game. Like Williams says at the end of the paper, what does it mean to go on in the same way, right? But there are answers about that. So <clears throat> this is a little bit of an advertisement for taking Philosophy 102, um, but I definitely recommend it. I think it's, it's one of the best things you could do for yourself as a student is to take a take an ethical theory course, really get into it in detail. It's really fascinating and uh, just, yeah, meaningful, meaningful stuff. So um, for all those reasons, I have uh, not elected to incorporate that into the curriculum. And at the same time, I feel, um, you know, that's a choice. I've had reasons for it. It's so a trade-offs are involved here. And if you, the, the thing I worry about is, is just that I, you know, shortchange you as students of this class and not getting access to really important curriculum. So, I want to make a special invitation to you. Um, I have all of my course materials for Philosophy 102, including the readings, uh, electronically, same as we did for this class. And if anyone is like, yeah, I can't fit another philosophy class into my schedule, I'd really want to, to learn about that stuff. Um, I'm very happy to pass along my course materials to you, including the primary source readings and uh, the lecture notes that I've got on them, and some other like charts and helpful things for understanding what's going on. So, and I also have a sort of a crash course on ethical theory that I um, use as a part of teaching business ethics because we can't, or or my political philosophy class too. Um, you can't teach those subjects without getting into the underlying ethical theories. So um, I've tried to give, as abbreviated as I think is responsible, I've tried to give uh, presentations of those big three theories I was just mentioning a second ago. And you can actually find those up on my YouTube channel. Um, there's a playlist called Code of Intellectual Conduct and Ethical Theory Crash Course, I believe. And that was taken from when I uh, taught business ethics online before. And so you can gain access to some of the lectures where I explain that stuff there. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm happy to pass along uh, primary sources and lecture notes to you, uh, if you if you want them. So I don't want to hide that curriculum from anybody. And if you really want access to it, I'm, I'm happy to give it to you for free. You don't have to take the class uh, to, to get that. I do, though, if, if you do have room in your schedule and this is a subject that's interesting to you and you really would want to get into it, I think taking 102 is really worth your time and, and absolutely worth it. So um, if you got questions about that, let me know, but I want to make that uh, invitation out there. All you have to do is contact me and I'll, I'll hook you up. Um, so I uh, wanted to say that. So especially with us running out of time this quarter for myriad reasons. Uh, it's been, seems like the whole quarter we've been behind on how far I'd like to get with curriculum. Um, it's going to be abbreviated. Our treatment of ethics is going to be abbreviated this quarter, um, even more so than it normally would. Um, but I hope, uh, hope those explanations and answers and kind of given you a little window into what I've been thinking and making these choices. I hope that makes sense and um, that my kind of backup plan here uh, helps to blunt some of the negatives or drawbacks of the course that I've charted for us. 
Okay, um, any other questions people have before we uh, get rolling here with Wittgenstein? Doesn't look like it. Looks looks like we're all good. No one's typing anything in right now. Something comes up, let me know. Um, lots of stuff finishing off the quarter here. Um, I got to record some more videos last night for paper feedback. Um, I'm really, really hoping to be able to hit Sunday as the last day that you might receive it. If you're still waiting on feedback from me, um, you can expect it in the next couple days. Uh, I'll get I'll be getting something out. Um, no matter how hard I try, uh, each video seems to be going to like half an hour or something. Like that. I've, I've gotten a couple of them under a half an hour, and it's been hard to do that. So that this stuff takes time, <laughs> and I, I'm doing everything I can. Um, but uh, okay, let's talk about philosophy of language and Wittgenstein. First up, before we even get into the main topic. Uh, I gave you in the selections, the reading I gave you is hand-picked selections from, uh, that I picked out from uh, Wittgenstein's work, Philosophical Investigations, which is a massive book. It's really long, and even where I, I, I'm kind of skipping around and giving you some selections from it, uh, where I leave it off is not even close to the end of the story. So there's a lot going on in this book. But even with uh, how much is there and, and how much I wanted to give you access to, I still thought it was good to give you the preface. And this preface just tickles me every time I read it. Um, and I think it's a good uh, window into what good philosophy can look like, especially as you're working on your papers right now. I thought this, this could be maybe encouraging or inspirational to see one of the most notable figures in the history of Western philosophy, especially in modern times, like the Wittgenstein's 20th century, um, he's a big deal. Bertrand Russell, really famous philosopher. We read uh, his little thing on the value of philosophy at the beginning of the quarter. Very famous philosopher from the 20th century said uh, he had never met a mind like Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was a student of his. Um, and uh, he was just like, this dude's a, he's a genius, you know, just a genius mind. And Wittgenstein only writes two books in his entire life. He wrote something called the Tractatus, which was almost like a, a doctoral thesis or dissertation uh, when he was younger. And it made massive waves. It's, it was a, a major step in the world of logic and language in trying to unpack um, a logical system of meaning that then could be applied into language too, like inventing a new logic. Um, it's very, very technical and very hard to work through. Um, but Wittgenstein, his story is somewhat interesting. He, um, he becomes really uh, disillusioned about philosophy. He, he serves in the war. That really changes him. And he, he goes for a long time where he's like, philosophy's crap and <laughs> no one should do it. And it's like meaningless debates. And all this kind of, he really loses faith in it. Um, and then he comes back to it. Um, and he's, he's definitely not coming back to philosophy like, you know, drinking the Kool Aid. Um, he's, he's kind of an irascible personality. Um, not, he wasn't uh, very, you might say, personable. Um, that said, he is, um, he, there's a lot of, his, he's just a strange, strange cat. Uh, he's not by any means, um, uh, unethical or amoral, even though he does seem to have some, like, from people's reports, like, antisocial tendencies and things like that. Um, but he actually was deeply concerned with ethical matters, even though he didn't really work on them. We've got a lot of his, like, letters and, and other things that he, not published writings from him, that he, where he gets into stuff like this. And you get a little window into Wittgenstein the person. But, um, this, this book, Philosophical Investigations, is only the second thing that he ever published. Uh, the only other works we really got from him are collections of letters and then some lecture notes from his students. They're called the Blue and Brown books, um, which are also really difficult and impenetrable. Um, but in, when he writes, writes Philosophical Investigations, this isn't some kind of magnum opus. This isn't like Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, where everything's like laid out perfectly. As he says here, I'm, I'm quoting from the reading right now, um, 
I have uh, written down all these thoughts as remarks, short paragraphs, sometimes in longer chains about the same subject, sometimes jumping in a sudden change from one area to another. Originally, it was my intention to bring all this together in a, in a book whose form I thought of differently at different times. Um, but it seemed to me essential that in the book, the thoughts should proceed from one subject to another in a natural, smooth sequence. In other words, Wittgenstein's saying, I get it. I, I know what good philosophical writing looks like. Like you want to have an organized theory. You want to have all your thoughts and arguments like arranged in a logical way uh, where it proceeds smoothly and everything's in focus. He's like, here's my thesis. Here's my proposal. Here are the arguments. Here are the objections. Here are the replies. All the kind of stuff that I've been asking you to do for your papers. Try to make them as organized as you possibly can. Wittgenstein's like, I get it. Yeah, that would be ideal. That would be the right way to do it. And then he says, after several unsuccessful attempts to weld my results together into such a whole, I realized that I should never succeed. The best that I could write would never be more than philosophical remarks. My thoughts soon grew, grew feeble as I tried to force them along a single track against their natural inclination. And this was, of course, connected with the very nature of the investigation for it compels us to travel crisscross in every direction over a wide field of thought. The philosophical remarks in this book are, as it were, a number of sketches of landscapes which were made in the course of these long and meandering journeys. And I'm going to skip ahead here to the end. Um, uh, he, I, I'll talk about that actually in a second. Um, at the very end, he, he closes in this way. I should have liked to produce a good book. It has not turned out that way. But the time is past in which I could improve it. So he's sort of acknowledging, yeah, this isn't this isn't the kind of work you hope for. Um, but I hope it's helpful. He says right before that, I should not like my writing to spare other people the trouble of thinking, but if possible to stimulate someone to thoughts of their own. So he's like, I know this isn't perfect, but I think there's some good stuff in here. I hope you can do something useful with it. He's kind of like, I, I don't have a theory for this. I just have these thoughts. They seem interesting and compelling, and they they are. I mean, Wittgenstein is a big outside-the-box kind of thinker um, and really revolutionized so many aspects or, or just kind of another case of throwing a big stone in the pond, right? Not everyone's a Wittgensteinian, but it, it, you're hard-pressed to find a philosopher who doesn't think, Wittgenstein is making some contribution, even if he's wrong, that he's like the, the epitome of maybe being interestingly wrong. The way that he looks at familiar uh, and traditional theories and ways of thinking in philosophy and kind of approaches them with a different angle and shakes them up uh, or challenges them um, in ways that were not sort of thought of previously, that's a major contribution even if he hasn't been able to give a really firm proposal. Um, I'm not, I, I, I always say to my students, I'm like, if you had trouble with this reading, if you're not sure what he's saying, you're right. <laughs> like, I don't think Wittgenstein knows what he's saying. He's not sure where this is all going, right? Whether his line of thinking and reflection and reasoning and analyzing is actually, uh, like, what is the end result? What it, what's the takeaway? What's the upshot? Um, I don't think he not necessarily knows what he's doing with that either. Um, but, uh, but he can still be making a meaningful contribution to the conversation. Um, and so if you're having any kind of insecurity about your own written work for the paper for this class, um, this is another way in which I'm trying to encourage an attitude of like going for it, like just have ambition. Maybe you're not going to be able to defend your thesis at the end or got major objections or you know, you're missing a bunch of stuff. That might be happening. Um, it's always possible in philosophy. But you should go for it anyway. Um, and give it your best shot. Make your contribution to the best of your ability. Try it out. Stretch your wings. This kind of thing. Um, I, I, some, I don't know if I've mentioned this before, but uh, in my experience as a professional philosopher in that whole world, um, I, I always say every philosopher has imposter syndrome. Have, have you ever heard of imposter syndrome? No? No? Okay. Uh, okay. Um, so imposter syndrome is like a 
condition of thinking that you're uh, you don't really know what you're doing, um, but everyone else thinks you're like competent. But you're like, I don't I don't belong here. I don't belong in this world. Uh, I don't really know what I'm doing. Um, it it can it can happen in a lot of different contexts um, where someone feels like they're a phony and it's just no one else has picked up on it yet. <laughs> this kind of thing like. Um, philosophy is so full of genius minds like even Wittgenstein is like freaking genius right all these incredibly smart people and have all these interesting ideas and you're just like do I when you're in we have like a grad student in philosophy or even as a professional even today I kind of feel this way I, I'm, I'm not immune to this phenomenon either I'm like do I even belong like I don't know if I'm I should be here, you know, like if, do I have something useful or meaningful to say? Like you go to a philosophy conference and people are having all these debates and you're like, do I put my hand up and like say what I'm thinking? And like, is that at all smart, useful, insightful, interesting? You don't know um, from the inside. And uh, I don't know of a philosopher who doesn't experience that. It's not like there are some people going around that are absolutely confident and they're like, yeah, I do belong here. I, I'm smart. I'm intelligent. Right? Everyone's always like second guessing themselves about this stuff. And that's, I think that's, that's actually a credit to the world of, and culture of philosophy that because of w that would be a reasonable expectation of an experience if what we're trying to do is hold ourselves accountable um, as much as possible to our positions, perspectives, beliefs, and values. Um, that is tricky stuff. And we shouldn't have arrogance <laughs> about it. You know, it, it should. It makes sense that you could have this imposter syndrome experience, and I think that's a kind of a mark of some sincerity. Definitely, it can go bad. It can be debilitating, um, and that's why I'm encouraging you to like have ambition, modest ambition. That is the the combo. Uh, Michael asks, is there a difference between not being confident and imposter syndrome? Then, um, I don't know. Um, hmm, I'd have to think about that maybe. Um, I mean, confidence in general, I, I got some views on this philosophically. Um, I think confidence is not so much a, a matter of what I think a lot of times people traditionally think of it as being. That uh, confidence is a matter of being in a position to predict that you will succeed. Like a baseball player going up to the plate and being like, I'm going to hit a home run and then they do it. You know, it's not so much a, confidence is not a matter of pre of being of knowing your ability and being able to predict that it's going to be effective. I uh, so I, I actually think that confidence and um, and say fear <laughs> or or uh, uh, a lack of maybe being able to predict that you're going to do well. Uh, are compatible. I think of it as kind of like courage. Um, courage is not a, uh, it, courage is not uh, meant, I think, to mean that you don't feel fear, or that you don't experience fear. Mm -hmm. Courage is really what you do when you're afraid, that you choose to engage anyway, even though you are afraid. It's like your response to fear is what courage is. That's what I think confidence is too. Um, many people, have, many of my friends, students, people I know are like, Tim, man, you're so confident. And I'm like, doesn't feel like it from the inside. <laughs> I, I never feel that way. Um, but I do, I, one thing I've, I've sort of trained in my character over the years is a willingness to participate. And I think that, that willingness to participate mm -hmm. is what reads as this kind of confidence, uh, like as if I'm, I know that in my, my, my abilities are strong and effective or something like that. I, it's more of like just showing up. Um, and I think that's the main thing. And so I'm happy Wittgenstein didn't let his um, insecurities about his own work being uh, ideal uh, stop him from sharing this. Because what has happened is since Wittgenstein put his ideas out there, mm -hmm. um, many people, he had a lot of students, um, took his remarks here or his suggestions and reflections and tried to make them into theories. And those theories have been really uh, helpful. Um, I teach some Wittgensteinian, uh, uh, basically a Wittgensteinian-esque way of approaching understanding language that is really refined by one of his students, Austin, 
in my critical reasoning class. We do some, some uh, philosophy of language there as a part of the critical reasoning curriculum, and it's indebted to one of Wittgenstein's students who took his, his ideas and tried to formulate them into um, a more cohesive, coherent uh, uh, theory. So um, you never know. Like, you, your, your work can ha bear fruit that you can't necessarily anticipate. Um, Wittgenstein was definitely um, depressive, um, ang had anxiety disorders and things like that, um, but he kept working and kept participating, um, and we are the beneficiaries of it, right or wrong. Uh, he's had a lot of influence. So is that uh, making sense? I, I mean, this is a kind of a long intro, actually, <laughs> looking at the clock, uh, but I thought it was worth talking about. Um, I think there, it's the, sort of the human side to all this philosophy stuff that we do, um, I think is, is useful. Okay, um, so getting into philosophy of language itself. So we had these like three big divisions, right? Metaphysics, epistemology, ethics. Where does philosophy of language go? It's, it's not, um, it kind of touches on epistemic matters, it touches on metaphysical ones, but it's kind of its own little like sideshow. And, uh, and it, it's a big one because think back about how I mentioned that um, <clears throat> epistemology is one of these ubiquitous topics in philosophy because no matter what else we're talking about, knowledge is sort of in the area, right? Well, language is kind of like that too, philosophy of language, because no matter what else w other topics or questions we're inquiring into, we're going to be using language as a way to talk about it, to conduct discourse and debate and give theories and, and all that kind of stuff. So understanding what we're working with when we're using language may, may offer some insight into actually doing the philosophical work, which is why I put it in my critical thinking curriculum. You know, before we get to the logic straight, there's like, what are we working with when the fact that we're always going to be debating and reasoning and discussing things in a language? Like, what's the medium we're working with? And Wittgenstein is kind of like the classic example of someone trying to solve philosophical problems or address other philosophical problems through a more careful analysis of language. And Wittgenstein has some pretty hot takes on this. Like, he thinks most of the classical philosophical debates are really not, they're non-problems. They're problems that we've invented because we're misusing language or misunderstanding language and its meaning. Um, I'm not sure he's right about that. But there's some, there's definitely some room for this possibility. And, and uh, that's one of the reasons why philosophers became um, very interested in studying language. And it, we've always, philosophers have always been interested in language, but um, it, there was definitely a movement in the 20th, early 20th century around uh, philosophy of language as being the way to uh, solve problems in philosophy. Oh, audio's cutting out. Uh-oh, lag. Let me know when it's getting better here. I was having all these technical issues this morning, um, and then I, I thought we cleaned it up. Hold on. Yeah, getting better. Is it catching up a little bit? Can't hear me at all. Uh-ohs. Mm. Mm. Oh, man. All right, sorry for the gap in that video here. I think I just reconnected and everything's looking good. Okay. All right. <clears throat> what was I talking about? Language. Solving philosophical problems through an analysis of language became uh, a kind of a, a, a fad, you might say. Um, but this is, a, this is a big movement in early 20th century philosophy. I think it's cooled down quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of uh, late 20th century and 21st century philosophy that's like, yeah, language isn't probably going to sort all this stuff out for us. But it still is respected as like, th this is a piece of the puzzle. And language is just super confusing. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I started the YouTube recording again. Yeah. Um, language is super confusing, so it's the kind of thing that you want to um, 
you know, maybe think about just as a subject in its own right, uh, as an area of interest. The other thing that's really the legacy of this stuff is um, cognitive science, which is actually another area of specialization for me personally as a philosopher. I've spent a bunch of time in this. And nowadays there's question about, you know, same thing we could ask, what's the meaning of a linguistic act? When I make an utterance, like I'm saying all these words at you right now, what's the meaning of what I'm saying? Or what's the meaning of a work of art or a poem or music or all these sorts of things that are ways that we communicate with each other? We can also ask questions of what is the content or meaning of my mental states? So the states of my consciousness, how, are, how is thought have content? It seems like just like uh, language is representational, so are our mental states. Our mental states are representational for what's going on in reality. They're about something, right? My thoughts are not just about myself, or like Plato says way back in the Theotetus. It's the same idea here. Is it with the eyes that we see or through the eyes that we see? And he says it's through the eyes that we see. The mental states of, of visual perception or any other perception are representa uh, representational for something that is not about them, like a picture that represents something else. Like when I drew that picture of a car and I'm like, this is a car, but it's not a car. Like you can't drive the picture to work kind of thing. So a lot of the issues that show up around giving an analysis theoretically of language and linguistic meaning transfers over to issues with mental meaning or what's sometimes called the language of thought. The, the meaning, the semantic content of our mental states. Um, and actually, one of the problems that Wittgenstein brings up for language is a problem I did direct research with in cognitive science. So it applies like straight over. So, so that's some of the motivation for the field and what's going on. Um, let's talk about what Wittgenstein is up to for his analysis of language. So I've mentioned that he's, he's definitely coming at this from a different angle, from like left field. Uh, turning, he's like flipping the table. Everything's getting turned on its head here. Um, he's arguing against a traditional view of language, um, which you got in the very first aphorism. The number one had a, lat a bunch of Latin at the beginning from Augustine's Confessions. It's translated below in the footnote. Um, Augustine is going to be, he, he's, a, he's a philosopher. Um, he, he's not just a religious figure. He's a serious philosopher, St. Augustine. Um, and he did a bunch of work here uh, in a number of different philosophical fields, but including language. Very old stuff, um, but still not like we've moved very far beyond Augustine's account of language by the time Wittgenstein picks it up. Um, he, Wittgenstein's going to use Augustine as like the poster child for the traditional way of thinking about language. And so when I talk about the Wittgensteinian model of language, I might also talk in contrast about the Augustinian or traditional view of language. And let's, let's start with that. So what is the traditional view of language and our understanding of its meaning? Um, and then what is Wittgenstein saying contrary to that? And it's a little tricky, actually, uh, as everything with Wittgenstein, but I, I can help you make sense of it. So I think if I asked you, like we're all in the class together and you like talk a little bit more easily, um, if I asked you to like give me your theory of what do you think linguistic meaning is, you would probably say something like, um, like Augustine does. You might say, um, well, language seems to be a matter of a person having a thought and then finding a way to encode it, like in noises, like just like a making, inventing a code. Maybe you did this with your friends and your kids school, something like that, like substitution codes or something, or a decoder ring. You know, you, you have an idea, you encode it into a system of conventions, linguistic conventions, and then it goes out there like the noise coming out of my mouth. A receiver hears that noise and knows how to decode the noise into more ideas. So there's this encoding of ideas and a decoding of ideas. And as long as the idea that the speaker hears and the idea that the speaker intended are sufficiently similar, then we've got successful communication. And if they're significantly different, then we had a failure of communication, a failure to communicate. That's what we have here, a failure to communicate. Okay? 
Um, does that sound like what you think of when you think of the phenomenon of language, sort of metaphysically? Um, people in chat, does that that sound about right? About how you might think about it, or how you've been taught it? Mm hmm. Pretty standard. Yeah, same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. All right, so I'm getting a lot of confirmation there. Uh, well, three people. <laughs> um, I, my guess is that I wish I could read the room right now, but my guess is this is what you're probably thinking. And what's actually happening with that? Um, well, in this Augustinian theory of language, of what language is, what linguistic meaning is. Meaning is a matter of a relationship, a representational relationship between a sign and what it signifies. So uh, we could even use literal signs here. So a red octagon, what does that mean? Stop. Yeah, it means stop. Why? Why does it mean stop? Does it have to mean stop? Because reasons. <laughs> because that's how the stop signs are. Because you're taught that it did. Ooh, I like that, Nathan. Maxim says it's just a shape. Because of the word on it and its connotations, Faith says. That's all. So a bunch of these are kind of circular. Bernadette just says red. <laughs> Julia says social norms. Nathan Brown says because reasons. Nathan says we give it a meaning. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. I like. Uh, there's some good stuff in here. It means yield in California, basically. <laughs> Funny joke. Also meaningful. Yeah. Okay. So some of the answers that people just threw down are patently circular. They don't really help us. They don't. They use the same thing to explain the same thing. Um, but some of these are are really getting at what Augustinian would Augustine would say. That it's just rules. They're arbitrary. There's no reason. There. So when people said because reasons, you'd say no reasons. There isn't any reason. A red octagon doesn't need to mean stop. It's just a matter of convention that we've decided to all play by that rule. So that the sign, the symbol, is going to be associated with what it signifies. And that could just be a matter of convention. Like when you're playing a board game. Wittgenstein is going to talk about board games in the reading. When you're playing a board game. Do these pieces have to be these pieces? Do they have to be shaped exactly like that? No. Why do they work the way that they do? The rule book said so. You know, just convention. Can you house rule the board game if you want to? Sure. Nothing's stopping you. Purely conventional stuff. Okay? There's no absolute reason for these things. Now, in the quote from Augustine here that Wittgenstein quotes from, um, you know, there he's, he talks about natural languages, that there are associative links between some symbol, a representational object, and what it represents that might come intuitively or naturally to us. Um, Augustine's remarkably sophisticated, given you know how early he is in the game here, and the lack of science to really lean on here. But we now know uh, we definitely have uh, scientifically confirmed things like certain instincts that infants have, like right after they're born, they watch the eyes of their of their parents. You know, so you're like holding the infant just right there, and they're looking around. And when the parent directs their attention towards something. The infant also directs their attention at the same thing. And we seem to be like pre-primed. Our brains are pre-primed for making associative connections between the direction of attention and other things, especially the sound of the human voice. So the human vocal range we're like calibrated for. You know, we're tracking for that. Um, infant brains are automatically, without even thinking or reasoning about it, picking up on phonemes, like little bits of sound that we combine together to make words and sentences, um, and that those get calibrated. Um, and that's why people, um, 
you know, when they kind of get their, the, the system is open and then it gets calibrated by exposure and then it kind of gets set. And that's why it's harder to learn languages later in life or to speak without an accent is more difficult. But early on for the infant, you don't even have to do anything. Like when I had my kid, I was like, oh shit, how are we going to teach him language? This is going to be tough. And we didn't do shit. We just talked to him. You just talk to him and he suddenly starts speaking. It's like, what? <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> it's not much you have to do. Um, you can you can add some other things in there for his other bells and whistles, but there you, a child, a human child, will just pick up language. They will just do that. Sometimes it works at different stages. Like I remember my parents telling stories about me. They were like they thought I was their first child, and they were like, is there something wrong with Tim? Because he's not talking at all. Like other kids are talking, and he's like totally silent. And then. Um, so I was a late bloomer on this, but when I started speaking, I started speaking in full sentences, and they were like, "What?" <laughs> so like, what's the, everyone, there might be some different paths on this, but our brains are like pre-primed for this. Um, by the way, some some terminology here that's going to be useful going down the road here. First is semantics versus syntax. Semantics is really referring to what Augustine is talking about with meaning. A sign signified relationship. Semantics is whatever the word stands for, whatever meaning it has. Now Wittgenstein wants to challenge that, so he might want to say, well, the Augustinian model of semantics is bogus. But the, in many ways, I, I don't mind associating semantics with, Vic, with Augustine, the traditional model, just because Wittgenstein is looking in a completely different way for how to analyze the meaning of words. Um, and when we talk about semantics in linguistics, where like it's like dictionary definitions. You know, if you're if you're taking a new class, uh, if you're taking classes in some language that you you weren't raised with, you're going to be doing lots of vocab flashcards, right? And you're learning semantics when you do that. This word stands for this. Syntax are about the rules for how we combine meaningful words into complete thoughts, like in sentences. So sentence structure, grammar, that's all a matter of syntax. That's about the form of the words, and semantics is about their content. So you put that together and you've got a linguistic theory, or so the traditional story goes. The other uh, bit of ter terminology here that I'll be using quite a lot is ostension, or learning by ostension. And ostension is about pointing. Ostension is about pointing. So when we were saying a second ago about how an infant, when they're born, like follows the eyes of their parents and directs their attention at what the parents are directing their attention to, well, it's like you're pointing with your eyes, just like you could point with your finger. And if I'm like, um, cup, cup, or actually, I'm going to do this right now, the word, right? Which, by the way, this is it for today. This is this is what you need to put into the quiz. I know it's uh, mirrored for those of you on YouTube later, but there you go. That's it. Right? So I'm pointing at it. And, it, and if I'm like cup, 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 then you're going to associate cup, this noise, with this thing I'm pointing at. Okay? Or if I say Tim, 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 this is like learning meaning by ostension. If, if uh, Augustine is right and linguistic meaning or semantic meaning comes from uh, an association of a symbol with what it stands for, then ostension is the way we can learn these things. Um, we can use ostension to establish a connection between a noise and, and something else, right? Lucas asks, the object or the words on the object? Oh, 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 the words on the object. There you go. Nathan, thank you for putting it in the chat. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, so much here for the traditional or Augustinian theory of language, that it's all about sign signified relationships. So if you're going to be competent with a language, you need to understand the code. You got to know what things stand for. And if you don't understand, Augustine would explain that as saying, well, you're just, you're not aware of the conventions. So if I listen to... I love Tamil music, uh, sort of a weird um, interest of mine, uh, Tamil music, but I don't understand Tamil at all. Uh, it just is a bunch of sounds to me, um, and I like the sound of it, um, but uh, I don't know what it means. It's just a bunch of gibberish to me. Um, 
maybe uh, you might be aware of the internet meme of Benny Lava. Um, his actual name is Prabodiva. Uh, pop star um, did stuff with Michael Jackson. He was actually part of his dance crew when Michael Jackson was touring. Amazing dancer, really great, fun music. Um, but there's all these uh, YouTube videos of Prabodiva songs and their music videos where they do misheard lyrics around it all because you just don't you just, there's just a bunch of sounds and then you're trying to you put some other meaning to it but you don't know I don't know what Prabodiva's mm -hmm. singing about because or he's not usually the singer it's usually a, a lip sync thing but um, I don't know what they're singing about because I just don't have the conventions of Tamil under my belt. I don't have those vocab words, and I don't know the grammar rules, so I can't do the decoding. Um, so language is primarily a matter of um, having the awareness of these sign-signified representational relationships and then encoding and decoding them. So as, uh, as Augustine says here, let's look, let's look at the quote directly. Um, maybe we'll finish. This will be the last thing we do today. When grown-ups named some object and at the same time turned towards it, I perceived this. He's imagining himself like a young child. And I grasped that the thing was signified by the sound they uttered, since they meant to point it out. This, however, I gathered from their gestures, the natural language of all peoples, the language that by means of facial expression and the play of the eyes, of the movement of the limbs, and the tone of voice indicates the affections of the soul. And all he means is just like the ideas, right? Uh, the mental states. When it, um, when it desires or clings to or rejects or recoils from something. In this way, little by little, I learnt to understand what things the words, which I had heard uttered in their respective places in various sentences, signified. And once I got my tongue around these signs, I used them to express my wishes. And actually, for Augustine to put it that way is remarkably prescient, because we know um, we know that uh, people or that children um, understand language way before they can speak it, before they can get the the, 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 the mouth to do the stuff. Um, oh no, I'm cutting out again. Oh, shucks. Ah. Uh, am I back? You able to hear me? Yep. Okay. Okay. All right. I was just reading through the passage from Aphorism 1, the Augustinian passage, and remarking on how it connects with basically everything we've been talking about so far in this lecture. Um, and at the very end here, I was remarking on how um, Augustine even anticipates the way in which children understand language before they're able to speak it before they're able to get their mouth to make the right noises, they're still able to understand the sign-signified relationships. Pretty cool stuff. So um, we're, we're out of time here. I know i got to let everyone go. Um, next time, we'll actually talk about what Wittgenstein has to say about all this um, and what's going to be totally different. But he's basically going to say, Augustine's completely wrong here. or Well, not completely wrong, but just that language is not essentially about these sign-signified relationships and actually has nothing to do with what's going on inside your head. Conventions and those that could be a part of language, but not everything that is language is that. Um, and that it has everything to do with just behavior, with behavioral games that we play out here in the world. Not about a thought, not about an image, a mental image, but it's really about the significance for action, for how we coordinate action together, like playing games with each other out here in the world. He wants to get outside of the head and sort of make it external. He's an externalist instead of an internalist about language. Okay, so uh, I'll leave you at that for the weekend. Um, please give me your response papers uh, as soon as you can. If you don't make the deadline, I will still accept them, but it, it might be nice to your uh, the person, your the author, the paper that you're commenting on, to get them to them as soon as possible. Um, I will be forwarding them along as I get them, and then I will be also giving you my feedback as well. You're welcome. You're welcome, everyone. Have a great weekend. I'll uh, I'll see you on Monday if we don't talk sooner than that. Bye bye.